everybody. Welcome to the very first episode of the Atlantic Center for Independent Living Sill podcast. We are a non-residential, non-profit support advocacy and resource center for people with disabilities. And this podcast will be discussing issues relating to people with disabilities on the state, national, and local issue level. And as we know, you'll come to find out during this podcast, all our issues are disability issues. And I have two awesome guests. I have two guests here from the Community Health Law Project, Rachel Ionieri and Samantha. And Samantha, how do you say your last name? Detroit. Detroit from my favorite legal nonprofit. I do play favorites. They are the best that I, I always refer to in Atlanta County. Because we're going to talk about the number one issue that I hear about all the time is housing and what are my rights with housing and what are some of the challenges that people with disabilities face with housing and kind of the misconceptions that are out there with housing. So I'll start with Rachel. Rachel, you can introduce yourself and can you give like a brief summation of what a landlord's rights and responsibilities are and what a tenant's rights and responsibilities are and kind of best practices on both ends. Thank you, Donald. Well, Sam and I are very happy to be on the first podcast for the SIL. This is very exciting for us. So um, as Donald mentioned, we are with the Community Health Law Project. We are a nonprofit law firm. So we work with low-income people with disabilities. And as Donald mentioned, we cover Atlanta County and we cover the counties in South Jersey. We are a statewide organization. So if you are listening to this from other parts of the state, we do have other offices throughout the state. And we work with people in civil type matters. So we don't do criminal things, but we help with housing. We help with welfare benefits, getting social security, things like that. Things that affect people's everyday lives. So as Donald mentioned, yes, housing is a big one that we get a lot of questions about and a lot of questions of, can my landlord do this? What do they do if I do this? So I'm going to talk a little, and Sam's going to talk a little bit about what the general idea of landlord tenant court and landlord tenant law is in New Jersey. So in New Jersey, we have a pretty strong landlord tenant law, which means if you are a tenant, you have a lot of rights. One of those rights is that the landlord cannot just kick you out. Landlord can't come knock on your door and say, you know what, it's time to go, you have to leave. We have a court process in New Jersey and Sam's gonna talk a little bit more about the court process because that has changed since COVID, but there is a court process in order to evict somebody if they are a tenant. Now, some people are not a tenant. Some people have been staying at a place, they don't pay rent or they're in places that really they have no legal right to be, in which case they would have to be ejected Um, And that's a different court process that we're not going to get into today, but somebody would have to still bring a court action to kick somebody out. So one of the big things to take away from this is that you as a tenant have rights. And what a tenant is, is someone who basically has been paying rent somewhere. So whether it's an oral lease, whether it's a written lease, a lot of times people think I had a year lease and it ended in New Jersey. It doesn't end. It goes month to month. So unless you decide to leave your apartment, you do not have to leave unless the court says you have to. The landlord can't just tell that you on their own that you have to get out. So Sam is going to go through some of the things in New Jersey under the landlord tenant law about why a landlord could sue you for eviction. Because things like I don't like your shoes is not usually a reason that they can evict you. So Sam's going to talk a little bit about that. I do want to mention again, Donald asked about the the responsibilities of a landlord. In New Jersey, responsibilities of a landlord are having a safe and habitable location. One of the questions we always get is, my apartment is the pits. You know, it's not great. There's a lot of problems. A lot of times people think, you know, my place should be better. But again, and we'll talk about, you know, what do you do if there's habitability issues? What do you do if the water is not working? Things like that. As anybody who's watching this knows, housing is a big problem right now. The availability of affordable housing is the worst that it's been in a really long time because there was a moratorium. People weren't going anywhere. So there's not a lot of available places to go to. So sometimes our options at this point is to see what we can do with where we are rather than easily finding another place. Right. I think that's a great point, Rachel. Well, a bunch of great points. One, I just want to highlight, don't, a lot of people, like you said, think that, well, my rent lease ends in a year. I guess I don't have any rights after that. That's not true. And the other point I want to highlight is 
you know, housing is such a difficult issue, especially in New Jersey. And the truth is it's gotten worse, as Rachel said, because of COVID. And also, we don't build enough of it. Like, there's not enough of a supply of a, affordable housing. So, I mean, people say, I need affordable housing. I get SSI, Social Security income. I get a, a little about over $700 a week. What do you, I got to move out of my house this week. What should I do? And I'm like, well, you're not going to find a place, because, you know, for that. Even if it's affordable housing, because affordable housing wait lists can take two to three years before they get to you. And a lot of times there's a wait list to get on the wait list. So, right. so I just think Rachel had a great point. Or, or what she's saying there is the most important thing is shelter a lot of times. So sometimes wanting a, a your white picket fence with your beautiful yard, sometimes that's not an option. And we're not saying that's right either. Look, in my world, we were building a lot more affordable housing. But when you're talking about your life, you got to think strategically and smart and kind of, I know it's tough, take the emotion out of it and make your best decision. And one of the things that you just mentioned is that, you know, help with paying for housing. So anybody who gets SSI benefits, even if it's a dollar of SSI, you can ask for help from your local board of social services mm -hmm. for emergency assistance or temporary rental assistance. Temporary rental assistance will help with paying for an apartment each month. So if you get SSI and you need help paying your rent, you should absolutely file an application with the Board of Social Services. They have to allow you to apply. And if you get denied, you can always reach out to our office or to another legal services office. But putting your name on wait lists is a good idea. Um, yeah. Trying to see if there's any vouchers available or good ideas to try to help with the housing. Right. And you got it. This is a a big thing you have to really take an active role and that your organization like a SIL and SILs exist statewide. We're just the one in Atlanta County, just like the Community Health Law Project is for this county. This is something you really have to take an active role in and you, you got to get on as I always say, get a, the best time to get on a housing wait list is when you already have some form of housing. <laughs> like that's the best time to sit and wait because if they call you and you're fine, you just call. It's not a marriage proposal. It's not a lifetime commitment. You just say, I'm not interested. I'm good. And then move on to the next person on the list. But waiting to the last minute in life is never a good idea. It's probably the worst idea when it comes to affordable housing. It's probably the worst idea. And as Rachel just said, it does help if you get a dollar of SSI that does open up some resources for you. But I know there are people who get SSDI and maybe don't make enough to afford housing and are, but are still just as uh, vulnerable as our people on SSI. So it is a tough situation. Absolutely. But I think knowing the process is very important. Absolutely. So Sam's going to tell us a little bit what the process is and so that you have an idea of timelines and, and kind of what you right. can expect to get from, from a landlord if there is an issue. Right. So like you were saying, Rachel, a landlord can't just go to a tenant and say, I want you out and they have to leave. They have to go through the court process first. And so in New Jersey, we have what's called the anti eviction Act. And that act lays out different grounds for eviction. So a landlord would have to file a complaint in court for eviction and allege one of these grounds. And so a lot of what we see is tenants not paying rent or tenants not obeying certain lease provisions or something along those lines. And each of these grounds kind of has their own notice requirements. So if the landlord's saying, okay, you're not doing X, Y, or Z, that the lease says you should be doing, the landlord has to provide certain notices. Now, the exception to this, unfortunately, is with non-payment of rent. A landlord doesn't have to give you any kind of notice before they file in court. So you might just get the court date in the mail with the complaint and the summons. So Sam, let me ask, is there a law that says you have to be three months behind before they can file? Um, no, unfortunately, you can owe a dollar and your landlord can file. So it doesn't matter if you're one month behind, two months behind, or a whole year behind, your landlord can file in court for non-payment. I got another question, Sam. What if your landlord has accepted kind of late payment before, but this month decides, you know what, I don't want to be that generous. Can they still file or does the fact that they accepted late payment before, does that change anything? So Rachel can correct me if I'm wrong, but no, 
if your lease says you need to pay on the first of the month and you don't pay on the first of the month, then they can go and file for eviction for not. Yeah, that, that's really important because I think people, well, he, he let, they let me do this. You know, that doesn't matter. For filing, late is late. If it's a dollar or if it's a, we don't care about what happened last month. We're talking about right now. <laughs> so, so. And a lot of places have a lot of turnover, right? So the other manager that was there didn't care that you paid rent. And a lot of manage a lot of apartment buildings, they change managers frequently, right? And now a new person comes in and looks at the books and says, whoa, you're behind. But one of the things about that is that people with disabilities can ask for reasonable accommodations. And when you pay your rent could possibly be a reasonable accommodation when it comes to landlord tenant law. So if you do get social security disability, as Donald mentioned, when you get it based on is when your birthday is. So some people might get it the third Wednesday of the month. If you know you're always getting your income the third Wednesday of the month, you can ask your landlord and say, I have a disability, I'm getting social security disability checks, I get them on the 15th, can we make my payment day the 15th? And if they say yes, then you're not late every month by two weeks, right? So wow. that is always something that you can ask for as a reasonable accommodation. We'll talk a little bit more about reasonable accommodations, but when it comes to paying your rent late, that may be one that fixes that problem. If it's I'm always so glad problem. you said that because I didn't know that that was a backed by the law that that's a reasonable accommodation. I, that's great to know. Yeah, but Sam, as you, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I just, I always like to, to, uh, to point out these things because like there's these myths that are out there. Well, the mm -hmm. landlord accepted this rent before late. What, what? Oh, well, you know, this is our new process. But, you know, like I said, it was only a dollar. Well, for the law, they don't care. <laughs> so. And Sam, are they allowed to evict people who have disabilities? Yes. If the law really does not make a distinction between someone who has a disability and someone who doesn't have a disability when it comes to the grounds for eviction that the anti-eviction, you know, statute lays out. Yeah, that's that's important to know too. I hear that too. <laughs> I hear that too, Rachel. I hear that too. And so what's the process? What does the landlord have to do? What do you have to look out for as a tenant? Right. So with non-payment of rent, like I said, landlord doesn't have to send you any notice before they file in court. They can just go to the court and file for eviction. And so in a normal pre-pandemic world, basically, you'd get the notice in the mail and you'd have trial in two weeks, three weeks. Really quickly, it would happen. And then that day, you'd have a mediation in court, and then you'd have the trial. Now, because of COVID, a lot of the courts are running behind. So the court date may be a little further out. But something that has also changed because of the pandemic is now there's a case management conference before there's a trial to kind of see where the case stands, what's going on, you know, if it's a non payment of rent issue, what's owed. And to really try to hammer out those issues. And then maybe a week or two later, there's the actual mediation and the trial. And is court happening in person now? No, right now everything's on Zoom. So as a tenant, how am I going to be able to participate? So the court sends out the Zoom link. And if not, then anyone can contact the court and get the Zoom link, and some people just don't have the capability to use Zoom, and they can also provide a call-in number, just a phone number that you can call on your cell phone or house phone or something like that. And you can also, at this point, go to the courthouse, correct, and use their Yes, computers. the court also has computers. I think you have to let them know ahead of time, maybe, that you might need to use one for the trial, so you can call the court and make sure that there's one available that day for you to use. And Sam, I know this sounds obvious, but I think it needs to be highlighted. How important is it to show up? <laughs> like, how important is it to show up? I know a lot of people think, well, I don't have technology. I have a disability. Everybody should understand. For the legal purposes, of the law recognize that, really? You know, it's, it's very, very important to show up. If a tenant doesn't show up, then the judge has the ability to just rule in favor of the landlord and enter what's called a judgment of possession, which means that the landlord can then go and get a warrant of removal and you can be evicted. You can be evicted. So it's, what if, it, go ahead, Rachel. So some of the problems that people have been having is I didn't get any notice. I did not know that there was a court date. So if it ever comes up that you didn't know, you didn't get any kind of notice, 
nothing was sent to you, you didn't have an email, you know, definitely reach out to us, reach out to another legal provider, because there may be a way to, in order to show cause, see if you could do it again, especially if, if there was a default. Now, if the landlord doesn't show up, then the case gets dismissed. So there's always this case, it, you know, it'll go to a mediation. One of the big things that I hear all the time for non-payment of rent is tenants say to me, I'm going to tell the judge my story. They're going to understand why I didn't pay the rent and they're going to give me more time. Unfortunately, the judge cannot make a landlord wait for their money. So the money is due by 430 the day of court. Now there was a new law that was passed right before the pandemic that gives people an additional three days to pay, but you need to have the money. The landlord can always enter into a payment plan, into an agreement, but they do not have to. They do not have to wait. If you ever enter into an agreement plan, make sure that you are able to pay the money and make sure it's very clear. So when I help people do agreements, I will say the money is going to be given at five o'clock at the Wawa on 123 Main Street, because if you just say they're going to pay it and the tenant shows up at 505 and the manager's not there anymore, they're going to say, you didn't pay it. And they're going to say, but I tried. So it needs to be a very clear agreement between both people of what's going to happen. Because if you don't follow that agreement plan, the landlord can still evict you. That's so fine. it's very important if you come up with an agreement, not that I think I can get the money, that you really are going to have the money. Right. That's a great point. And also, like you said, be very specific. And I would also throw in like, you know, document. If you are showing up, living up to your agreement and showing up on five, send a text to your landlord. I'm coming as part of our agreement. I'm coming to your house to drop off the money. And you could even, if there's a way, take a picture of you putting the money where it's supposed to be. Like you have to be, I go back to strategic about this stuff because mm -hmm. people, you know, no matter how unfair you think it is, the landlord could say, well, I never got that. And you don't have anything to prove it. It's like, well, you're in a harder situation than you need to be if you did a little. And, and one of the oh. things I always like to tell people is that it's not healthy to go through life thinking that you're always going to have to defend yourself in court. However, when people say to me, I paid my landlord in cash and I didn't get a receipt, I cannot bring that up in court. I don't have any proof. Lawyers really like paper. Judges really like paper. We want to see proof. Mm -hmm. So when you are paying your rent, make sure it's either direct deposit, it's through a portal, it's through a money order that you keep the receipts, it's through cash, but you're receiving a receipt. You need to show some proof. I've had people who send me a picture of $100 bills sitting on a table. That doesn't What's tell that me. Mean? Anything, right? What's so, that mean? You know, if a landlord ever says you didn't pay me, and again, it goes back to these managers changing, right? They may not be keeping great books. You want to be able to back up your side of the story saying, I paid my rent and here's proof that I did it. Because if want... you show that you did, that goes a long way. Right. I want to highlight the point. It's not about being right or wrong. It's about what you can prove. Like you can be completely in the right. You could be exactly right. You could have sent that money. The landlord could be lying. Guess what? The court, Rachel has no way, way to defend that. She has no way to go, my client's a really per nice person. Here's a nice story. She needs documents and Sam needs paper and they need right. stuff they can show. And it says, no, that didn't happen the way the landlord right. said. So we're not and, trying to be harsh. We're just trying to be real with right. you about the reality. And um, so we were just talking about non-payment of rent. So Sam had mentioned that there's other reasons that people can get evicted, right? And so those typically will come down to possibly a trial in front of a judge. So Sam, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, so as Rachel was saying, there's, you know, many other reasons besides just non-payment of rent. It could be that you aren't following the lease. There's disorderly conduct. You're violating the landlord's rules and regulations. And again, you know, that comes down in trial to what you can prove. So a landlord's allowed to have witnesses. You're allowed to have witnesses. You know, sometimes there's police reports and things like that and other documents that can help support you know, what you're saying or help support what the landlord's saying. But ultimately, at that point, it's up to the judge, you know, does the judge think that you violated your lease? Or does the judge think that you were having, you know, disorderly conduct, and then the judge makes the decision and you can be evicted for something like that as well. If the judge thinks that you did what the landlord is saying. 
And so one of the other things that we were talking about was reasonable accommodations. So we deal with a lot of people with mental health issues. And sometimes if people are not on their medications, they're not in the therapy that they should be, they might be acting inappropriately. They might be acting in ways that violate the lease. They might be loud. They might be argumentative. They might be doing behaviors that are different from what they would if they were on medication and in therapy. So sometimes we are able to argue that someone needs a reasonable accommodation because now they're back on their medication. Now they're back in therapy. And we're basically saying, look, this was a blip. Give them another chance. You know, hopefully we have some documentation from a, a doctor saying that now this is their medication, this is their therapy. And sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. But that's something that people with disabilities sometimes end up having issues with landlords, with other tenants. And that's something we can try to help with. And, um, that, and that, I just want to highlight that reasonable accommodation argument. That's something you would argue to a judge. And that's really up to a judge to see how they feel about it. Is that accurate? Yeah, I mean, if there is an attorney on the other side, you know, a lot of times we will try to work with an attorney before court to see if it's something that we can work out. Ultimately, their attorneys are representing the landlords and we're representing the tenants. And so sometimes an attorney will bring an offer to a landlord and the landlord says, look, this person has been harassing people for two years, causing a lot of problems. I'm not going to agree. And then, then that's where a judge will have to make the decision. Reasonable accommodations are something that is allowed under the law and it is very individualized. So a reasonable accommodation is something that is for someone with a disability that is a modification of a rule or regulation that has to be asked for and has to have some documentation for. So it has to be from a psychiatrist or a healthcare provider saying this person needs X because of their disability. Certain disabilities, some people don't wanna disclose. They might have HIV, for example, and they don't want the landlord to know that they have HIV, right? So there are ways that you don't have to disclose necessarily what the problem is, but the accommodation has to be reasonable. So I want to be able to have a Mack truck in my apartment, not reasonable, right? I want a parking spot that's closer to my apartment because I have difficulty walking, that might be reasonable. Mm -hmm. I need some actual accommodations as far as, as I mentioned, the when my rent is owed. One of the big ones is having an animal, right? Is it a pet? Is it a service animal? Is it an emotional support animal? A lot of landlords will say, I don't allow pets. One thing that's very important to know is that an emotional support animal is not a pet. So if people have an animal, a dog, a cat, a bunny, a bird, because their psychiatrist, for example, says this is necessary for their anxiety, for their depression. That's something you can ask for reasonable accommodation with a letter from your psychiatrist backing up that you need this. Again, it does not have to be certified like a service animal does. So a service animal is able to perform a task, is able to go get a newspaper. An emotional support animal is there to provide emotional support. So we hear a lot of times landlord says I can't have a pet. Well, if you have some documentation from a doctor saying you need this animal, that's something we might be able to look at. And again, they can't make blanket statements because reasonable accommodations are on a case-by-case -case basis. Mm -hmm. Now, I have a question. Does that apply? Does it change at all? Because I've gotten the question about emotional support animals. How many can you have? Could you have your psychiatrist say all three of these cats are for emotional support? Is that legit? What happens then? You, and again, it's a case by case basis. And, right. and one thing that lawyers love to say is it depends. Yeah. Right? It depends yeah. on the situation. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I've, I've been in court where the person had 10 cats and the judge was like, eh, 10's a lot. How about three? You know, or right, the psychiatrist will say they need Mo, Curly, and, yeah. you know, they need these three again. And there's no, there's no size requirement. There doesn't have to be a small animal. Now, again, if you're saying I need a hundred pound crocodile, <laughs> right. right. You have to look at it as reasonable. Right. Is that going to be a danger to other tenants? This is when it's good. And then Sam, I'll let you jump in. This is when it's good. You as a tenant to step back, try and take the emotion out of it and go, how can I be reasonable? So I'm on that side of the reasonable scale that yes. Rachel was talking about. Like, do I need 10 cats? And if I do need 10 cats, let's, let me have my therapist really explain in detail why I need these 10 cats. Why these 10, what my condition was like before the 10 cats. Like, 
think about if my because and also think about it from a landlord perspective are they going to bother you over one cat probably not because it's, it's not one of the you start bringing in 10 cats that's going to ring some alarm bells and you could again you could be in the right and you could get lucky and rachel you could have a cat lover as a judge exactly. i could say i love cats we should have 15 but, but you could also get a, a judge who's like you know what i think this is ridiculous i think this is abusive and you're putting a burden on everybody else so i disagree with all this and it's not it doesn't matter what your personal opinion is it's about what how to win and get what's best for you so that's a good way to step back and think am i being reasonable you know am i being objectively reasonable am i being you know if i looked at this from a neutral perspective what would i think not i love my cats therefore they're all coming you know well and that that also goes a little bit about what i was going to say so you know we talked about having some help with rent right and that may be a section 8 voucher it may be subsidized housing one of the big problems with that is if you get evicted, there goes your voucher. The voucher, the subsidy is going to go away. So there are times when people will call us and say, I get Section 8. I haven't paid my rent. My rent's 100 bucks a month. I'm being evicted. What do I do? A lot of times, if you can move out before you get evicted, you're going to be able to save that voucher. If you were going to go in, especially what Donald was saying, if you're going to say, I'm right, I'm right about this. They shouldn't have done this. I'm right. I want to tell my story to the judge. You're going to be evicted and you're going to lose your voucher. So now instead of the hundred dollars a month you were paying, you're now maybe, maybe, maybe going to find a place for 1200, which and, you can't afford. And I just want to say those vouchers are like the golden Willy Wonka gold. ticket. <laughs> like, like, do not, Absolutely. do not hurt so, yourself. And and shoot yourself in the foot and get rid of your voucher. Like that is not a Absolutely. good thing. <laughs> so best advice that I say to people, when you get your rent, when you get your check each month, if it's social security, if it's working, if it's whatever, pay your rent first. There is assistance with utility assistance. There's assistance with food. There's assistance with a lot of things. If you don't have your apartment, you don't need electric because you don't have an apartment anymore. And if you lose that voucher because you didn't pay, you're not going to get emergency assistance. You caused your own homelessness. You're going to be in big trouble. Yeah, that so, voucher opens up a lot of doors, not only mm-hmm. for housing, but it just makes your life a whole lot easier. <laughs> and so one of the things that did change, and Sam was mentioning things that changed with the pandemic, is there is this little window that we have right now with certifications that Sam's going to talk about that might be able to reduce the amount of money that you have to pay in order to stay. Yeah, so during COVID, um, a lot of people had trouble paying their rent. And so legislation was passed, which basically allowed for people to fill out this certification. And this certification is for people who owed rent between March of 2020 and December 31st of 2021, if they met certain income guidelines, if they fell under a certain income, and if they owed the rent due to some reason related to COVID, it could be because you had increased expenses because you had to buy masks and you had to buy hand sanitizer and things like that. And so basically what this certification does is you're saying, yeah, I couldn't pay my rent. I had to pay for other things or I lost my job. And so the judge sees this or sees the certification and they, you basically can't be evicted for rent owed during this period. Anything between March of 2020 and December 31st, 2021. Now anything after that period, now that we're going into April, you will still have to owe. And so even though you can't be evicted for this rent during this period, your landlord still can pursue other avenues to try to get this money so they could sue you in small claims court or special civil court to try to get this back from you, but you can't be evicted for owing rent during this period. So so can people still file this? Yes, and it is useful, um, even though the period's over, you know, if you haven't paid your rent since March of 2020 and your landlord's saying, okay, you owe me from March of 2020 until March of 2022, it really helps because when you fill out the certification, they say, okay, well now you have to pay between January, 2022 and the current date. So you might only owe three months instead of, you know, two years worth of rent. And so you might be able to, you know, come up with that or work out a payment plan 
And so that's really useful in that aspect and kind of getting that balance down and what you owe and what you can be evicted for. In addition to the certification, which you can fill out online and you have to give a copy to your landlord, you do have to also apply for rental assistance from the DCA. And the DCA, whether or not they have funds right now is a little unclear. They're still trying to get funds. So the requirement is not that you receive funds from the DCA in order to have this protection, it's that you filed for assistance. So that's important as well. There are some other places still right now, post COVID, that are trying to help with rent and trying to help people to avoid eviction. So those are definitely something to look into if, if you are in fact facing eviction because of non-payment of rent. But one of the things they will look at is, you know, can you pay rent going forward? So if you call Catholic Charities, Salvation Army, you know, all of those places, they're probably going to want to know where'd your money go and, mm-hmm. and what do you do in the future? And exactly. so if you're in a place that you cannot afford, most places aren't going to throw money at you to, to keep you there because you're still going to end up getting evicted. Right, because um, those places have to justify where they're giving you the money and they look for right. sustainability because they could have used that money. Like if you're right. going to, it's it, not to be harsh, but if you're going to lose the place anyway, they're like, I'm not going to put good money after bad. And um, right. yeah. So one of the other things that people ask a lot about and kind of talked about was habitability. So a lot of times people will say, look, my toilet didn't work. I stopped paying rent because my toilet didn't work. So aren't I justified in doing that? I'm, you told me I was supposed to have a place that had a working toilet. So Sam, can you talk a little bit about habitability? Yeah, so um, with habitability, a lot of times people will say, like Rachel was saying, okay, my toilet's broken. I don't want to, I'm not going to pay my rent this month because I can't use my bathroom or, you know, my kitchen sink doesn't work. And it's kind of a sticky situation because you never just want to withhold your rent without following the proper procedure. You know, you have to do certain things in writing and really make sure you're doing it the right way and not just choosing to withhold your rent. And then even if you, you know, do it the right way, you notify your landlord in writing. If you get to court for, you know, not paying your rent and you say, okay, well, I want to talk about, you know, how my sink didn't work and I, you want to have what's called a habitability hearing you have to have all the money that you did withhold. Um, otherwise, a judge won't listen about you know the sink or the toilet or whatever the issue might, might be. So one of the things that's really important, sorry, Donald, um, is that you want to make sure it's in writing. And a lot of people like text messages nowadays. I always recommend certified mail and regular mail. In New Jersey, if you send regular mail and it doesn't come back, it's, they assume that they got it. So you always want to send a written letter you know, as we talked about, I've told you my toilet doesn't work. I only have one toilet. Please let me know when you're going to be coming out to fix it. You want to make sure that you give them a good amount of time to fix it. You don't want to start saying the next day, yep, you didn't come out. You also want to let the people in who are going to do the work. A lot of times people say, I didn't want to let them in. Well, they can't fix it if they can't come in. So that's something you want to talk to the manager, you know, if you're concerned about who's coming in, you know, ask who's going to be coming. When are they coming? You want to make sure it's an appropriate time. They're not coming at 10 o'clock at night. As Sam said, you have to have all of the money that you withheld. As soon as you start withholding the money, the landlord can file for eviction against you. Now, one of the big changes that just happened that's going to go into effect as of May 1st is if a case before this, what's, what's in the law right now, the landlord files against you in court, there is no way to get it off. Even if they meant to file against Donald and they filed against Rachel, no way to get it off of your housing record. So if they searched your name for a new apartment, it's going to show up. Starting May 1st, that is going to change. If the case did not go to a judgment of possession, so they sued you for eviction, you paid all the money, the case gets dismissed, now it's not going to show up. If the case got dismissed for another reason, landlord didn't show up, not going to show up. Also, anything over seven years is also not going to show up. Now, one of the things with the protection with COVID is that they did block certain cases during COVID because they didn't want that to follow people that they couldn't pay during COVID. So there were a lot of protections during COVID that now have gone away. So these new protections that I just mentioned start May 1st, but if you get a judgment possession against you, that is going to show up and there is no way to get that off for seven years. Um, You can't do an expungement. There's no way to get it off. So if you are thinking about withholding rent, just know the landlord's probably going to file against you. And 
If you're on SSI, please always remember if you have more than $2,000 of resources, your SSI can be terminated. So it's really kind of tricky. And I definitely recommend you talking to an attorney. And again, our services are free, South Jersey Legal Services. Talk to an attorney if you're having a housing issue so that we can talk about the best way for you to try to work out the housing issue. Because also, as we talked about, there's not a lot of available housing. And housing with landlords and managers is like any other relationship. And if you start bombarding them, if you start being um, rude, if you start being demanding, a lot of times landlords are going to want to say, you know what, I don't need this. Second, they're late with their rent, I'm filing against them. One of the other things I forgot to mention is this Anti-Eviction Act only applies to landlords if there is more than three units, if the landlord, if the landlord lives in a place. So if there's an apartment, if there's a house, there's four units, the landlord lives in one, the Anti-Eviction Act applies. If there's three units, it doesn't apply. And the landlord, if it's called owner-occupied, can actually give a 30-day notice that I'm ending your lease because I don't like the color of your shoes. So when people are looking at where they're going to live, whether or not the landlord lives on the property is, is going to be a big determination of what rights they do have. So it's something to keep in mind. Again, people who live in these big apartment buildings, there's a manager who's there, that doesn't matter. Um, they have all these landlord tenant rights. So the other thing with habitability is a lot of times people say, my toilet doesn't work. I'm going to withhold my $800. There's no set price in New Jersey of what a toilet is worth, of what running water is worth. So a judge, even if you post all the money and you have a habitability hearing, the judge could decide that leaky toilet was worth $800, was worth zero, was worth something in the middle. And so the idea of posting your rent is if the judge decides it was worth $800, you get all your money back. They decide it's worth nothing, you get zero back. So it's, it's very hard because people will say, you know, I didn't have heat. Well, was it September? Was it June? Was it December? That makes a difference. You know, was it something that there was a water main break in the town and there was nothing the landlord could do about it? That makes a difference. So like everything else, it depends. So. Yeah, all these little factors really matter. And like, I just want to highlight, it's you really, really, I mean, withholding rent is just, a, even if you're totally in the right, it's like a, a really big gamble. And I really mm -hmm. think people really, I, they get, I, you know, people get all fired up and they're all like, this is wrong. And I'm going to, you know, withhold the rent and then it doesn't work out so so i i always say if you got i mean i understand a lot of people they can't pay and that's why they're not paying and then you know you got to work out from there but but i really warn against people withholding rent because I, I think if you have it and you've been paying you've been making it work in your life you should keep that going because like i said i know when resources are so limited it's really you're really hurting yourself and, even you if know, it feels good in that moment Absolutely. And we've been able to work out some things with landlords because, again, sometimes people aren't able, right, because you're in it, right? You're living it. You've been right. frustrated. You're going to lash out and that's not going to get you what you need. As, as Donald said, doing things calmly and, and respectfully is the best way to do it. Sometimes people don't feel that they can do that. That's where sometimes, you know, Sam has been helping us sending a letter to the landlord, you know, with the client saying, here are, here are the things that need to be fixed, right? You know, I've talked to you four times. I still have a lot of mice, you know, please send out an exterminator. And sometimes the landlord will say, I didn't know. You never told me, right? You yelled something and I don't know what you <laughs> meant. That's not giving me proper notice, right? I'll, I'll come out tomorrow and fix it. So sometimes, as you said, we get very, when it's our own life, we get very frustrated and very angry and very all at one time. And sometimes it helps to have somebody else come and say, let's, let's write a calm letter, right? Let's, let's handle it that way. Because if you start yelling and the cops are called, that is not going to help you get your apartment fixed any faster. And in fact, it might lead to your eviction. And if you're on a subsidy, lead to your homelessness. And that's what we try to help prevent. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of ways to try to work things out the best way we can. And sometimes people need outside help. And that's where reaching out to Donald, reaching out to the other members of the cell, reaching out to us, you know, to say, hey, this is what we need. And, and unfortunately, I tell people, even if you go to a judge, the judge is never going to give you the, you're right, you're right, this was horrible. The justification and the motivation and the attaboy that you're looking for, judges don't do that. So, even <laughs> no. the judge, you know, no. so a lot of times when people want to tell their story, 
unfortunately it's not going to go well and it's not going to get you what you want and, and what you gotta, we want is for people to be housed and you got to keep in mind is judges are hearing stories all day every day so so i know you think your story is the most important most you know injustice but they're hearing this everybody's got a reason and a lot of them are good and a lot of them are not so good i think a general rule of thumb is just the more reasonable you are the better it'll be, even if it goes to the, even if it goes to court, because it'll strengthen your case. If, if they're really not doing their job and fixing that toilet, but you demonstrate, look, I let them know by text, by certified mail, I've been working with Rachel, and I've been paying my rent on time. To me, I'm a judge. That's a strong case, because I'm like, what is this landlord doing? What are they doing? Like, what are they, why haven't they fixed that toilet? That's a good a good tenant. So it's not only the right thing to do, kind of just being a decent person and keeping your respect about you, but it's actually strategically the better thing to do. Because I think, you know, even though judges are supposed to get go by the law, the more reasonable they see you being, I think that helps. I think that does help. You know, wait a minute, they've been paying their rent on time and they let you know four times through text message that their toilet was broken and you haven't responded. Like, whereas instead of, well, you shouted something at them through the window to me and just like well what's going on here like i don't know i see why the landlord didn't answer that phone call right away because he left them eight messages cursing him out right. <laughs> so so we're, I, we're, I not, that. we're more likely to help people when people are nice as yeah. a general rule of, of human nature right all right and a landlord by the way has it as a self-interest usually in keeping you in there because they they you know time is money and a vacancy is money so a lot of landlords do want to just work something out because going to court is a pain. <laughs> yeah. so. and, and with with that, what you're saying is a lot of times people say to us, can I break a lease? So, for example, if they do have a year lease and six months into it, they want to move. They found something better. Can I break my lease? So in New Jersey, again, if you do not want to stay in a place, you don't have to. However, if you tell your landlord, I'm leaving and you, there's still six months left on your lease, the landlord has to try to mitigate their damages. That means they have to try to re-rent the place. So if they try to re-rent it and they missed out on two months of lease, of money, they again still could sue you for that two months if they didn't give you permission to leave. Now, sometimes if, this, if the relationship's going sideways, they're like, great, see you later. <laughs> you know, you want to get that in writing. And one of the other things is security deposits. A lot of times people ask us about security deposits. So my best rule of thumb too, is when you move into a place, take pictures. If there is something that is broken when you move in, make sure you take a picture. Make sure when you walk through with the, with the landlord, you write it down, right? There is a big hole in this wall. Just making sure everyone agrees that there was a hole when I left or when I got there. When you leave, make sure you do another walk walkthrough with the landlord, take pictures, make sure you have a forwarding address because the landlord has 30 days to give you your security deposit back or to give you an itemized list of where the security deposit is going. They cannot do normal wear and tear. So cleaning apartment because someone moved out is not a reason to keep your security deposit. There was no hole in the wall and now there is, that could be a reason to keep your security deposit. Right. If the landlord doesn't give you your money in 30 days or doesn't give you a list, you can actually sue them a court for double the amount of damages. But again, you got to give them a forwarding address, whether that's a PO box, friend's house, somewhere. People will say, oh, I didn't give them anywhere to send me my money. <laughs> How are they going to send you your money? <laughs> no. so, I didn't give them anywhere to send that money, but now I want it. So. <laughs> yeah, carrier pigeons don't work very well. <laughs> The other thing that's important to remember is if you get security deposit from the Board of Social Services or from an agency, that money goes back to you. So you don't have to pay it back to the board. You don't have to pay it back to Catholic Charities. The idea is that you use that for the next place. What gets tricky is it says the landlord has 30 days to give it back to you. So sometimes there's an issue of having enough money for the next place because they don't have to give it to you as you, as you leave. There's something to keep in mind, again, if you get SSI, you can ask for a security deposit. If you get Section 8, Section 8 does not pay for a security deposit. So if you get SSI and you get a Section 8 voucher, you can apply to the Board of Social Services for a security deposit. And security deposits in New Jersey can only be one and a half times the amount of rent. Landlords can't charge first, last, middle, a third, <laughs> one and a half times the amount. And they should give you a notice of where the rent is being, or the security deposit is being kept. It's account number one, two, three at the TD Bank on Main Street. If they don't give you that within 30 days of you moving in, 
you can ask the landlord to apply the security deposit to your rent. There was an emergency order that allowed people to use other things with their rent, but uh, security deposit, but unfortunately that has ended. So at this point, landlords need to know what they're doing. And some landlords don't. We typically don't tell the landlords what to do. They can contact an attorney on their own. We point out when they don't do what they're supposed to do, when it serves our, our interests. <laughs> uh, landlords have to be registered. They, you know, there has to be a certificate of occupancy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, sometimes, especially when the housing market is what it is, Sometimes people try to rent places that should not be lived in mm -hmm. or that has not been zoned by the, the town or it doesn't have a fire code. So it's hard when there's a very small amount of places to be really picky, but it's really important that the place is safe and that the landlord's doing what they need to do. Right, right. All right. So I think like, I think this was a great discussion. And do you have, do you have, if you can give like, two or three tips to people entering a lease. Do you have like, what, what are just takeaways from this that you think people should, should really take away? I mean, I can think of a few, but I mean, I just wanted to ask Sam or you if there's any like good pra general rule of thumb where it's like, oh, this would have been so much easier if you did X. <laughs> so, um, I can think of one. Okay. You said, just pay your rent first. Yes. Uh, before anything else, pay your rent. I agree. And I agree. I think, you know, pay your rent, get things in writing, be engaged in the process. Like, I, I see this all the time. People think, well, if I ignore that notice from the landlord, it, it will go away by magic. No, that's it's not how it works. It's better to call a place like Atlantic Sale or call a place like Community Health Law Project and get that process started as soon as possible because if we're going to help you, we can't just do that in a day. Right. <laughs> like, you know, one of the have... other... go ahead. One of the other things I was going to say is that when you have a lease, make sure you know what that lease says. Make sure you know what you're responsible for. I've seen so many people say, oh, I had no idea I'd be responsible for cable and water and gas and electric. I had no idea that I couldn't do this. I had no... Make sure that you read the lease. If you need help reading the lease, reach out to somebody to make sure you understand Never sign anything you do not understand because once you sign it, not understanding it is not a defense. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure if they are responsible for utilities, you know, reach out to Donald, reach out to Ocean Inc., reach out to 211 is a great resource. Mm -hmm. Get some help with paying those utilities. You know, again, there's a lot of resources in New Jersey and a lot of times people just don't know what's out there. But you need to make sure, especially if you have some intellectual disabilities, if you have problems with reading, don't be embarrassed. You want to make sure you understand in clear language what you are signing because right. you're going to be held responsible to it. Yeah, that, that, that's, 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 yeah. Pay your rent first. <laughs> yeah, I, no, I, yeah, pay your rent. Then you're in a much better position, whatever happens. <laughs> so and my if other... you have any yeah and, and and like donald said if you get any notices if you get something calling someone earlier rather than later is the best thing to do we have a lot more options before court than when you call us because the warrant of removal was issued one thing i do want to mention is there is something called an order for orderly removal really tricky name but if you do have a warrant of removal you can ask the court for another seven days to leave and that's especially helpful if you have another place lined up. And that's even if you have not paid the money. There is something called a hardship extension. So if you have paid all the money, you can actually get up to a six month extension if the judge gives it to you, if there's a hardship. A lot of times, if you have a disability, you have children, that's where that might come in helpful, but you have to have all your rent paid. Right. One other thing I forgot to mention is some people um, with disabilities need caretakers. Right. And so sometimes they need an additional room. That's something if you're getting a voucher, you know, you might be able to get a two bedroom, even though you're the only one on the voucher because you need a caretaker. You need someone who's there to help you. It's not just a friend. It's not someone to come stay over. It's you actually need assistance. So there are a lot of things to help people in New Jersey. And the key is knowing where to reach out to them. We do not charge for our services. So you can always call our office. Our office is located in Collingswood, but we do cover Atlantic County. I can give you our phone number. It's 856-858-9500. Again, 856-858-9500. And you can always call and we can give you advice. We may be able to represent you in issues, but it's always best to find out what your legal rights are. Sometimes you might not like the answer because 
you know, the law isn't the best sometimes, but sometimes we might be able to help steer you in the direction that's going to help. Yeah, I do want to, I just want to give a shout out to, because I went to law school, I want to give a shout out to all my attorney friends out there. They do not write the law. Their job is to tell you what the law is. So don't get mad at your community on law <laughs> project for, for telling you what the law is. It's not what they think the law should be, or what if they wrote the law, how they would write it. They are right, they are, their job is to tell you the reality of what the law is. So when they tell you something they don't want to hear, a lot, they're doing their job. <laughs> they're doing their job. Oh, one other thing I forgot to mention, there is another new law that might help some people um, regarding criminal backgrounds and housing. So a landlord is now not supposed to ask about a criminal background, a criminal history on an application, um, unless it's Megan's law or it's Sam, some like production of meth in public housing. But if they offer you an apartment, then they can do a background check. And depending on what the offense is and what degree it was, depends on how far back they can look. So again, if you're watching this and a landlord has said, we are not accepting you because you have this criminal charge. The criminal charge is from 10 years ago and it was a pretty low level charge. You know, that's something we might be able to fight. You can always reach out to us and, and right. see whether that's something that the landlords are allowed to do. And again, that's a new law as of January 1st, 2022. So again, hoping to allow some additional people. One other thing kind of related to housing, but one of the other changes that happened recently is people who had a drug distribution charge we're not allowed to get general assistance. And general assistance in New Jersey allows you to get temporary rental assistance or emergency assistance, which can help with housing. That law has since changed. So if you are watching this and you have a drug, drug distribution charge and have been told in the past you cannot get GA, you should go back and apply for general assistance. They cannot deny you now for having a drug distribution charge. Once you get that general assistance, that opens the door to applying for emergency assistance or temporary rental assistance, which can help with housing. So that's something oh, to keep in are, mind. That, that was just great information. And I just think this was a great first edition of the podcast. I think people get a lot of their questions answered. And thank you so much. And Sam, do you want any final closing thoughts? You don't have to. I don't want to make it like pressure, but 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 yeah. uh, I want to think but uh <laughs> yes, and I, just again, my three tips that I got pay your rent on time no matter what's going on. Early is better. Call us still. Our number is 609-748-2253. That's 609-748-2253. You can get me an extension five. You can find us on social media. And our website, just Google Atlantic Center for Independent Living. And I, I would also say be reasonable. Be objectively reasonable. It helps. I know it's emotional. I know it's hard. I know you're dealing with personalities and people, but taking a breath before you write that text message to your landlord, taking a breath before you withhold your rent, you know, and doing this in a very strategic way is the best way to go about it. Because at the end of the day, the person it affects the most is you. So you can really have to think about, is this the best decision for me in the long term not if i curse and slam one out am i going to feel better in the moment how is that going to look if this goes to court and how is that going to bounce back on me and people who advocate for people and attorneys we want to help you so the more you can do to help yourself the better we are the more um support we have in helping you so thank you guys for being on the first edition of Thank the you. Atlantic Sill podcast. And I know I'd probably have you guys on again and talk about SSDI and SSI work requirements and all that stuff that I also get questions about. But thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you for having us. All right. Bye.